Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Sumeya Awad, and um, we're here to discuss APAC and the Israel-U.S. relationship spanning decades. Um, I'll be moderating the panel. I'm joined here by three incredible panelists who I will introduce momentarily. This, um, this event is hosted by the Adada Justice Project, Democratic Socialists of America, and Haymarket Books with the support of Jewish Currents, Justice Democrats, and Jewish Voice for Peace. The reason we're all here today is because of everything that we've all witnessed unfold in the last six weeks in Gaza um, and the brutal, relentless um, war that is being waged by Israel against two million plus Palestinians in Gaza. The death toll has already gone over 12,000 uh, Palestinians, over 4,500 children, and still climbing. And we're here to talk about why it is that the U.S. is continuing to support Israel, why there's this special relationship um, between the United States of, and, and Israel, regardless of uh, who is in power. President after president has stood by Israel in the last two decades. State Department after State Department has underscored the important and quote unquote special relationship between the U.S. and Israel. Um, and even now, as Israel is committing a genocide against Palestinians, um, the U.S. is continuing to stand by Israel. So I'm I'm going to turn to our first panelist tonight, Jason Farbman. Jason is the digital director at Jewish Voice for Peace, and he's been active in the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the anti-war movement for nearly two decades. Jason, we know that we've we've all witnessed the last six weeks of this horrific massacre. And um, we know that there's diminishing support for um, for what Israel is committing, for U.S. support for Israel among Americans. 66% of, of Americans overall support a ceasefire. 80% of Democrats support a ceasefire. 75% of people under 30 in the United States support a ceasefire. Um, and still our government is standing by Israel, um, not just um, politically and diplomatically, but also financially by continuing to um, give Israel military funding, um, including an increased $14 billion funding package. Um, and of course, we saw Congress censure in a very racist campaign, the only Palestinian voice in Congress, Rashid Atlayib, um, just last week. So Jason, could you start by just talking about why that is? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. Um, evening, comrades. Uh, happy to be with you. Uh, I mean, I think what you said is right, that the U.S., I mean, it's overwhelming, you know, military and economic support. It's also political support. Like every resolution in the U.N. is always like 172 countries to like the U.S. Uh, and Israel and like Palau or Canada or some other minor country. Um, and so it's like, you know, it just begs the question of like, why is, you know, why is this unceasing support happen? Um, and Israel's genocidal rampage, as you as you mentioned, is it's, it's really unprecedented in so many ways. Um, and and with like there's overwhelming support for an immediate ceasefire, there's a question about why President Biden is so eager to support it, why he's so eager to say, you know, fuck you to the to his own party, to the people who are going to vote for him, to the people who supposedly he's so desperate for to avoid another Trump uh, administration. Um, and so, I mean, he, he's he's gone on record as saying a ceasefire is absolutely not going to happen. And so, you know, when you see things like this, when you see Israel acting in totally unprecedented and massively violent ways, the entire world is, 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 is aghast, most of his own party is aghast, you, you you can begin to wonder who's in charge, right? Is it the U.S. or is it Israelis? Um, which is confusing because Israel is a tiny state and the United States controls the most powerful military in the history of the world, right? And so does the U.S. support Israel because it's scared of Jews, because some powerful, wealthy, you know, cabal supports Israel? No. I mean, I think most people watching this call would say no, that this is sort of like Jews control the world territory that we want to stay away from. But we don't talk about this question enough. The U.S. does not. Uh, the U.S. left does not have a clear answer for why the United States supports Israel. Israel, and I mean this is its own discussion at length. But I only have a few minutes, so I just you know in short, it's it's imperialism. Um, control over the Middle East is enormously important, and Israel is key to the U.S.'s ability to assert its control across the Middle East. Um, it's worth saying that imperialism is not like direct occupation and rule. I think people see bombings happen and they say imperialism, but like direct occupation and rule is colonialism. 
Um, I think what I think an understanding of imperialism is bending others to your will. When it's in the interest of uh, weaker countries to do what is in the interest of stronger countries, that is imperialism. When they're not able to assert their own needs and wants uh, independent of that. And for decades and decades, Israel has played a key role in helping uh, the United enforce U.S. interests across the Middle East. Um, and you know, I just want to say, like, if you think about how much it would cost for the U.S. to directly control the region, just saying it could, but to bring aircraft carriers, to put soldiers there, to house them, to keep them happy, to be sending you know uh, equipment all over the place, to deploy everywhere it needs to, that this would cost trillions and trillions of dollars. So you know, we know that there are ungodly amounts that Washington sends to Israel every year. But when you think about the alternative, what it would cost for the U.S. to control the region directly, $18 billion or $13 billion, whatever it is that we've sent you know, this year and last is a bargain. It's a bargain for U.S. Uh, for U.S. capital. And so, I mean, just to, to end the question um, here is that, you know, I think I think there's still I mean, I think there's lots of questions that I imagine people have. But I imagine one is that it seems like APEC has a lot of influence because APEC has a lot of influence. And so there's a question of like, who, you know, who is the tail wag the dog? Does the dog wag the tail? And I think it's true that APEC has a lot of power. But I think that it, it, there's a common conception that gets confused that the Israel lobby controls the U.S. because it's powerful. Um, when I think it's the exact opposite, that's true, actually. The Israel lobby is powerful because its, in, its interests intersect and support those of U.S. capital. Like when you look at history, um, we can get into this later, the Israel lobby doesn't actually gain much sway with the U.S. government until the United States identifies Israel as a key player in, the middle, in controlling the Middle East and starts throwing tons and tons of money. Actually, it's not an Israel lobby that tricks the United States into spending money. The Israel starts spending money, and then all of a sudden the Israel lobby uh, starts to starts to gain power. So I think, I mean, the short answer is imperialism. I think there's a lot of complicated questions uh, that, that come out of that. But I think that the, the U.S. left needs to really sharpen on this question and be very clear about why the United States uh, controls uh, supports Israel. Thank you, Jason. Um, I want to turn to Alex. Alex Kane is a senior reporter at Jewish Currents. Alex, how would you respond to the question of how do we explain this almost complete unconditional support that the U.S. Um, gives Israel? Um, thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I think it's a, a massively, um, it's a massively sort of um, complicated question in, in, in some respects. Um, I mean, I think Jason did a good good job at laying out the sort of geopolitical aims. I mean, what I was thinking when Jason was talking about this is that um, there's a lot of um, uh, cultural and political infrastructure um, that that has been um, built up in the United States and, mm -hmm. and to sort of seed, um, you know, wide set, sort of widespread support for, for Israel. And, um, uh, and I, I just want to focus on President Biden himself because I think he is um, a sort of paragon of this, um, both the political and cultural kind of aspect of this. And when I say cultural, I just mean like this notion that Israel is similar to the United States. Um, and I think as people on the left, you know, we always say, yes, they're both settler colonial states. But that's obviously not what um, – uh, that's obviously not – what what sort of the American political class and um, many Americans support Israel think they conceive of Israel as a liberal democracy, um, and Biden conceives of Israel as a liberal democracy, um, just like the United States. You know, he says, um, you know, over and over again that he believes in Israel as a democratic and Jewish state. Now, of course, that it's an internal contradiction um, to say that an ethnocracy can be a d democracy, particularly um, when it when it when it comes to um, Israel Palestine, when you know. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that that Israel is not a democracy, but that is the that is the that is the that is the conception of Biden, um, and that that conception also is widespread in in the American um, sort of Jewish community, and and I think more broadly in the American public. You know, I think there there is this um, this this notion of Israel as a plucky little democracy surrounded by these hostile uh, Arab regimes, and you know, um, Biden uh, and, and this view sort of very very easily lends itself to. To, to, to sort of a, a, a desire um, or a conception that the U.S. should support Israel. Um, and so, you know, um, I think there's there's also some, you know, like, um, you know, Biden has, ha Biden takes this sort of cultural kind of aspect of the U.S.-Israel relationship and um, f uh, melds it with um, this security uh, notion where he says, you know, if there weren't an Israel, the United States would have to invent one. Um, because you guys are protecting our interests, which basically is is what 
Jason is, is speaking to. Um, and and so um, uh, and then of course it 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 very much helps his his political career as he rises. He forges close relationships with APAC in Delaware, which where his where he's from, and and um, you know it, it sort of. Um, but w- when I did my reporting for in the latest Jewish Currents issue about Biden, I spoke with um, a former um, APAC uh, legislative affairs director, and he said like. Unlike some other politicians who, um, you know, basically changed their position or didn't even know anything about Israel before they got into Congress, Biden did come in with knowledge, and that we believe that he really knew about Israel in his um, in his being. And so the relationship was not transactional in the sense of you don't know anything or you're even a progressive that is critical of Israel. Biden uh, came in and was already supportive of Israel, and as a result, got some you know uh, uh, significant financial contributions in terms of, of his campaigns. And, and as he rose through the ranks of the Democratic Party, this relationship blossomed. Um, and so you know, I think I, I, I use Biden because there are some significant policy differences between um, Obama and Biden, while I would say the overall architecture that Jason um, laid out is, is certainly true. Um, there are significant policy differences. I won't get into them now because it'll sort of take too long. But just to say that there's like there's also some personal dimension here as to why Biden is pursuing this, even when you know his State Department is in revolt uh, over this policy. Um, and you know, so I, I think you take the personal, you take the cultural, you take the the sort of U.S. imperial interest, um, and and then you sort of um, add, uh, say on the right wing end of the political spectrum, a, a widespread religious um, sympathy for Israel, particularly among Christian, uh, white Christian evangelicals, um, some of whom have uh, sort of um, uh, belief that Israel is is uh, needed for, for the end times. Others who don't have that belief and just think that, you know, because God blessed the Jewish people, Christians are obligated to support Israel. I mean, I think that's another sort of uh, 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 web of support uh, for Israel. Thanks, Alex. And we're going to get back to Christian Zionism and sort of who are the players in the American Zionist lobby in a bit. But first, both you and Jason talked about Biden, talked about current U.S. Um, policy on Israel. I want to take us back, decades back to sort of the roots of this support, because the U.S. hasn't always supported Israel. Um, I think many people think that's been the case since Israel's inception in 1948, but actually that's not true. So I want to take us back in time, and I'll start with you, Jason. Can you talk a little bit about these historical roots of support um, and how they've sort of shaped the relationship between the U.S. and the Middle East? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I think this is also super important because, I mean, I think it seems clear to most Americans that the U.S. supports Israel and that probably some uh, uh, version of the stories that are told about Israel, the one that Alex was alluding to, are are true. But I think it's, it's confusing, right? So, you know, Israel, is Israel because of the Holocaust? Has it been like this eternal battle between, you know, Arabs and, 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 and Jews? Like, it's 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 quite confusing. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth saying that, that Israel is a very deliberate project. That it didn't just happen by accident. It didn't happen at the beginning of time. It happened in the you know what 1900, a little bit maybe before, a little bit after. Um, yeah, quickly, it's you know it's worth saying that Jews you know Jews were uh, Jews were oppressed, wildly oppressed across Europe, across plenty of the plenty of the world. And there are different responses to that. Some were internationalists, some were socialists, you know, some were anarchists. Um, and others, which was uh, were Zionists. This was a tiny minority, but essentially they're separatists. They're saying that they, look. We are oppressed. We're oppressed everywhere we go. There's going to be no way that we can get out of this. We need to form our own country and just be by ourselves. Um, and again, that's a tiny, tiny minority. But uh, I think the Zionists realized fairly quickly that they weren't going to be able to get any land without being, you know, the, the, all the land in the world is carved up already and it belongs to someone. So we can't get this land unless we provide utility to someone else. So the early Zionists wound up shopping around, you know, hey, uh, to, to like Belgium, to, to, to I think to to France, to, to and then wind up wind up in England with a relationship to to wind up settling uh, in the in the land that was inhabited by, uh, by in Palestine. Um, you know, there's this myth that like it, it Jews wound up in a land without a people, and they were a people without a land, and then it all worked out well. Um, but that's not true. I mean, the British, you know, the British were colonials. They weren't especially, I don't think, connected to Jews or the, or the Jewish liberation. So they played Jews and Palestinians off against each other. There was all kinds of fighting. Um, you know, I think a full history is beyond the scope of this 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 uh, this talk. But uh, 
I think you flash forward to the big moments when Israel exerts overwhelming military power over its neighbors in 48, in 67, in 73. We can talk about what's happening in that world if people are interested um, during the Q&A. But what happens is uh, the U.S. is emerging from World War II. Uh, it, the, the global capitalism, capitalism is spreading across the globe in like unprecedented ways, right? And in order to do that, you have to ship goods places, which means you need to package them, you need to um, preserve them, you need to transport them. All of these things require oil or petroleum. They all require oil. So at the same time, all of these oil deposits are discovered in the Middle East, and the U.S. planners are like, oh, shit, this is a huge source of wealth. It's a huge source of power, and the Soviet Union is going for it, so we have to gun for it, too. Meanwhile, uh, they actually have, like, no sway in there. There's a, like, you know, the Arab world is, you know, rife with anti-colonial. They're, they're throwing off one colonial power after the next. Um, and so they're not looking for another. And meanwhile, there's fights with Israel, and Israel is exerting like overwhelming military power. And every time you see like a major conflagration where Israel, like you know, is a bombing or taking more land in '68 and '73 in particular, you see enormous amounts uh, increases in the U.S. support for Israel. Kissinger was watching very carefully, was developing a relationship with um, with the Israelis. They understood very clearly that like if they wanted to help control the Middle East, they couldn't do it themselves. They couldn't do it by direct rule, and they needed a client state. So you see this relationship developing where it really is in their mutual interest, where I think the U.S. is still in control because it's by, by far mightier, but the U.S. can't preserve its control without the use of the use of Israel. Thanks, Jason. Um, Alex, I want to turn to you for the same question. Um, and also just a reminder to people, you can drop questions in the chat. We'll be gathering them throughout the next 40 minutes, and then we'll turn to them in the last half an hour. So definitely start putting those in the chat as they come up. Um, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, um, I I mean, um, Jason has a lot more knowledge than me on the intricacies and the, the, the details of U.S. support, like in the in the 40s and in the 50s and the 60s. What I what I will say is, you know, the 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 the, the sort of um, the first um, U.S. aid. Uh, first U.S. weapons to Israel were sent by by John F. Kennedy, um, and 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 this was a, at a crucial point uh, during the Cold War, uh, and particularly after 1967, right? So after 1967, when Israel uh, conquered uh, and, and the the West Bank, uh, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, and defeated um, uh, a number of, of Arab states, five or five or six, correct me, I'm not sure the exact number. I think it was about six Arab Arab countries that that battled with Israel. I mean, Israel, you know, militarily very easily defeated them. And this showed to the United States that Israel would be an incredibly important ally in the geopolitical chess game of the Cold War. Um, so I just want to underscore that, that, you know, the, the, that, you know, that the, the, the sort of roots of the, of U.S. weaponry to Israel were forged um, in, in the throes of, of the Cold War. Now, the Cold War is over now, right? Um, I mean, the Cold War ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the, in, in the early 1990s, um, and um, you know uh, that was obviously a moment of, of sort of um, unparalleled U.S. hegemony and, and U.S. support for Israel continued. Um, and, and sort of the next, I think, important moment in terms of contextualizing this is, is the war on terrorism. Um, you know, when when 9/11 happened, um, uh, this was basically during the Second Intifada. Uh, when Palestinians were using um, both nonviolent and violent um, means of action against Israeli soldiers and civilians to resist Israel's occupation. Um, and Netanyahu, there's a famous quote of Netanyahu um, uh, who said, you know, 9-11 uh, is good for Israel. And what he meant by that was that um, it, it, it allowed Israel to um, uh, even uh, draw closer to the United States around this rhetoric of fighting terrorism, just as the United States was battling Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, um, Israel was battling Hamas and um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, and and so, you know, this was framed by the Israelis and by significant parts of the neoconservative movement um, in, in the Bush administration as part of the same fight, uh, even though it's very, very different, Al-Qaeda and it's not the same as Hamas. And contrary to what Netanyahu and, and many others say, Hamas is certainly not ISIS. Um, and um, you know, the 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 war on terror really uh, drew in, um, really drew this alliance closer together uh, on a military level, and of course on a sort of ideological and cultural level. 
Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, Jason, I know you had a couple of things you wanted to add, so please go ahead and then we'll move to the next question and hear from Hannah. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, it just, I just occurred to me, I forgot, like, you just talk about the U.S. support for Israel just so embedded in the relationship. I mean, uh, in 1948, the Israelis had just finished waging a brutal war uh, where they just, you know, exterminated many Palestinians, drove them off their land, and they declared statehood. Um, and then five minutes later, five, literally five minutes after the, the Israel declares itself a state, the U.S. recognizes it as a state. I just want people to think about that for a second. Like, if today with the internet, anybody did anything on the planet and the Biden administration responded in five minutes, you'd be like, wow, that's weird, right? Like, there's no internet. I don't even, you know, I don't even know what phones look like in the 40s, right? Like, but the telegramming, right? So, like, obviously, there's a tremendous, like, the people are watching the region. They're paying attention to it. They're trying to figure out what's going on and they're putting in, like, bids to, to, to try to control it. Um, I mean, I don't have, you know, much, much else to add. I think what, what Alex said is, is totally right. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I, I want to move us to the next question, which sort of gets into the Zionist lobby, the American Zionist lobby, and, and what is it exactly, and who are the main players, and how does it exert influence? Um, and for that, I want to first turn to Hannah, Hannah Fertig, who is the Independent Expenditure Director for Justice Democrats, um, which is an organization that endorses and runs candidates, including uh, representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, and Summer Lee, among many others. Thank you so much for being here, Hannah. Um, can you start by just unpacking a little bit what exactly the Zionist lobby is? And, you know, APAC is obviously one of the main names that comes to mind, but there's also other groups like Democratic Majority for Israel. Um, how, how do they operate exactly and how do they exert influence? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if we want to look back, um, the pro-Israel lobby has been going since really, I mean, APAC was founded in, I think, 1963, which was 60 years ago. Obviously, its scope has shifted significantly since then. Um, but when you look at it, APAC is really the only, it's the largest and uh, bipartisan lobbying organization that also has a political arm that is now kind of spun off into also having um, different political arms like United Democracy Project, Democratic Majority for Israel, which get involved in democratic primaries. So you kind of have this like core organization that's doing many different functions. It has its lobbying arm, and it has recently, like since 2019, began to spend significant money in general election races and also in Democratic primaries. I don't think they've done Republican primaries, to my knowledge. So that is kind of how they have begun to develop. Um, and, you know, there are other organizations in this ecosystem, um, like J Street, which takes a little bit more of a, mm, some would say, moderate stance um, in their Israel lobbying. Um, however, you know, it's kind of changing by the day with this conflict. And, um, you know, these are the folks, like, especially at APAC, who are in the rooms who are telling Congress what to think and feel about Israel. They're taking them on trips that are sponsored to Israel. They're showing the picture that they want. And so this is them coming back to the United States and having an outsized influence on our uh, politics here because there are not very many uh, super progressive, like to the left, Jewish lobbying and political organizations yet, of course, JVP, um, you know, being an organization doing a lot um, has not been around for quite as long. Still, you know, we don't have that kind of money on the left yet. So it's created this very um, kind of imbalanced dynamic of what elected officials um, all the way up to the presidential level are hearing. Thanks, Hannah. Alex, you've written a lot about APAC, um, done a lot of research on it. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the history of APAC and, and how exactly they they operate um, and what's important for people to know about APAC, both like historically when it emerged and then especially today in, in, in this particular moment that we're in? Yeah. Um, so APAC is a very interesting history. Um, the guy who founded it, um, uh, um, was, um, he used to work for the state of Israel. 
And as such, um, he had to register um, as a foreign agent. In the United States, if you work directly for a foreign government, you must register under the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Um, it's not really uh, enforced as well as it should be, although in the Trump era, there was a ramp up because of all sorts of foreign lobbying, but um, that is the law. And, and he was a registered foreign agent. Now, he uh, realized that um, he wanted to create an organization that could mobilize American public opinion and American Jewish opinion um, in support of Israel, particularly as um, news reports emerged of Israeli brutality, particularly in was a particular mass massacre called the Kibya massacre. Um, and, 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 and that was a, a sort of Eisenhower um, spoke up about it and, and various other um, there was various other sort of negative news re news reporting about it and, and, and sort of that was one moment in which um, the, the, the people who'd eventually go around to, to form APAC saw and, 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 and recognized that we need an organization um, that can counteract this kind of negative image of Israel that, that was being developed in some corners. Um, and so he wanted to form an American organization that did not have to register as a foreign agent and instead were, was, was, was an American organization that could portray itself as um, as America, and, and that you know, and to be clear, they, you know, the people that formed it were Americans, right? They, they were not Israelis, and so, um, uh, you know, in there was, there's just a, I mean, tough to compress all of this history, but, but just to note that in the uh, uh, starting in the 1980s, APAC began um, its sort of grassroots um, uh, mobilization of Jews in every congressional district. Um, and um, basically a sort of strategy of forming small groups of um, Jewish Americans who were involved in the, in the political process and who could donate money to, to, to candidates in order to sort of um, uh, inculcate a pro-Israel uh, policy, um, even more so than, than, it, than it was. Um, and so that developed, and there were sort of these uh, political action committees that were not controlled by APAC, but were often run by um, APAC donors and APAC members, and and actually to get into the APAC leadership circles, you have to you have to pledge a certain amount of money to a particular candidate. So that was the beginning of the sort of congressional strategy. And they also actually they also primaried. Um, they also started primarying people. Actually, back then it was Republicans. You know, there, there used to be a wing of the Republican Party that was um, uh, a sort of skeptical of U.S. intervention abroad uh, and a sort of um, uh, a, a sort of thought that U.S. national interests, quote unquote, um, were harmed by the U.S.-Israel relationship because of the damage that it did to U.S. Uh, relations with other Middle Eastern states, and um, so there were plenty of Republicans who, who supported Palestinians, and and um, they recruited um, uh, uh, Democrats to run against these Republicans and beat them. Um, Dick Durbin, um, who is actually today the first the first Senate senator who called for a ceasefire, was an APAC recruit. Uh, Ryan Grimm uh, has a has some really good reporting about that in his book, and which I uh, I haven't read, but is was on. Uh, he mentioned it on on a recent podcast with um, Hannah's former colleague um, Walid, um, and and so um, uh, you know that was basically APAC strategy um, for for many years. But but the the PAC strategy, you know, um, APAC didn't direct. I mean, it, there were ties to APAC, but APAC didn't directly control it. And I think I mean, there, like it's kind of APAC is a very opaque organization. I, I I can't say I know exactly why they shifted into this. Um, um, open strategy of creating their own political action committee and their own super PAC. I do think that it was basically because they wanted they wanted more control over it and they they thought they could raise more money um, as as their own national organization. So in um, um, uh, twenty I think twenty twenty two if I'm not mistaken, Hannah will will correct me if I'm wrong. They created um, their their super PAC, the United Democracy Project. A very nice name. And, and also sort of ramped up their own and created their own political action committee to, to raise money as well. And as such, they, they've, they've spent, I mean, in, in the 2022 cycle, spent like $30 million in Democratic primaries to punish uh, or to go after progressive challengers um, to, to ensure that they wouldn't knock off incumbents because in 2020, there was a very big defeat that APAC um, suffered. Um, in the in, in the in the race in which Jamal Bowman knocked out uh, Elliot Engel, uh, Elliot Engel was the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. It was a close ally of APAC, um, Democratic Majority for Israel, which Hannah mentioned, um, which has like 
12 of their board members have ties to APAC. Um, they spent, um, you know, $2 million trying to prevent Bowman from winning and, and, and they failed for, for a lot of, uh, for a lot of reasons that, that, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, have to get into it at this moment, but, um, I think that was a signal moment for, for, um, the Israel lobby and APAC sort of thought that they, they needed to, to get into the race. So there's this interesting trajectory of, of APAC kind of having these, um, sort of smaller packs around the country, uh, sort of um, finally uh, sort of changing in 2022 into its own centralized political operation in which they're just raising gobs of money to hammer home, uh, to hammer progressives. And and, and now this year, we're, there's, they're, they're actually going to go after incumbents, um, which is um, a, a new uh, shift for them. I'm sure Anna, Hannah could speak to that more. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I want to turn to Hannah. Um, Hannah, can you also talk a little bit about like what's happened when progressives have attempted to challenge APAC? If you can give some concrete examples. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I kind of want to say what happens when APAC challenges the progressives. Um, I think like when we think about it, uh, the case study of what happened to Summer Lee last cycle, who's a Justice Democrats candidate. Um, you know, she is she was a local elected official. She came out. She was, you know, unapologetically not going to take APAC's line. And she ran on her values and she ended up getting spent against at wild ratios. So, I mean, APAC was running ads both in her primary and general elections, uh, not APAC directly in some of those cases, but affiliated organizations doing everything that they could to make sure that she was not elected to office despite being a you know beloved local elected official and uh, the front runner in that race um they ended up you know running a candidate that was much less well known and was willing to take up their line and you know they tried to punish uh representative lee for that in a really big way and she ended up squeezing out the primary by about a point and the general election by just, I believe, 12 points in the end. Um, but it was, you know, going into that, everyone really thought that, uh, that that was not going to be the case, especially in the primary. So it just goes to show that whenever um, APEC feels challenged or threatened by someone not willing to take their lines and their cues, um, they will spend, in that case, uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars in negative attack ads. Um, and in that case, they were running, you know, a white male candidate against a young black woman. Um, and this pattern has definitely happened in other places as well. Thank you, Hannah. Um, on on that on that sort of trajectory, um, I want to turn back to Jason for a few minutes. Um, and this is also something like all of you are welcome to answer this as well, but let's start with Jason. Um, so we've talked about like the power and the influence of this lobby um, and the specific groups that operate within it, APAC, Democratic Majority for Israel, um, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about like the movement? There's a, there's a really, there's a burgeoning and very powerful grassroots movement that has been taking shape over the last decade, I would say, even before, but I think it's it's starting to pick up that power in the last decade that is actively challenging the status quo um, of the U.S.-Israel relationship um, and sort of pushing back against this influence of, of the lobby. Can you talk about that a little bit, Jason? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, as I said, I've been doing this for for better part of two decades and many, many, many of us have been doing this for far longer. Um, for people who are just politicizing around this issue now or politicizing the last few years, it's night and day what it looks like to to organize around Palestine. In the United States, all sorts of uh, you know uh, pro-Israel organizations, uh, including you know Israeli organizations, the ADL, APEC, have tried to crush whatever you know student groups are putting forward boycott resolutions, are trying to make it illegal in different states. I mean, it used to be the case that like Israel was the only democracy in the Middle East, like Alex was alluding to this uh, earlier. I haven't heard that in a while. Maybe they're still saying that, but I have not heard that in a while. 
And I've heard in a while because they can't say that. You can't be the only democracy in the Middle East while you're actually influencing America to like try to destroy freedom of speech and whatever students are trying to push it on their campuses. So I think there's been a sea change in the way that people can participate. And as a result, the way that Israel has been able to respond is one thing to respond to like revolutionary violence and to say we're defending ourselves. Is it just another entirely to, with BDS? Um, and I think, you know, it's been true today. Um, and just you look around and there's protests everywhere. Uh, you know, we, there was the largest protest uh, of Jews in solidarity with Palestine a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C., when we occupied the rotunda. Then we, next time we turned around, Grand Central Station was overrun with Jews who wanted to cease fire immediately. Then you look around again and the Statue of Liberty, which is like, I, I don't understand how this even happened because Statue of Liberty has to be like a top DHS protected terrorist, like, you know, watch site or whatever. And instead, like 500 Jews get on a boat and take over the island. And they're like, you know, they have banners everywhere. But it's not just in New York. I mean, every like cities across the country where like we are struggling to keep up with all the new JVP chapters that are popping up or the JVP chapters that are, you know, reinvigorated, have people flooding into them to try to do things from Chicago, where is the largest Midwest uh, Jewish support for um uh, 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 for Palestinians to Los Angeles, to the Bay Area. Um, it was, I mean, it's so big in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Times just came out for ceasefire, which, you know, was, was stunning. Um, we're seeing, you know, in place after place after place, you don't see just Jews, you see all kinds of coalitions being formed to, to, to demand a ceasefire. And you see, like, what I think is true about, what I think is generally true about people is not that they're apathetic, but that there's sort of a learned helplessness. It's like, well, I'm angry, but what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, actually. I'm, you know, I'm sorry to tell people that like your individual feeling, you know, it's just, you can be angry and it's gonna be angry and you're gonna be angry by yourself. It's not until you have 10,000 people or 50,000 people pointing in the same direction with the same anger that you actually start doing something. And all of a sudden people are seeing ways to plug in and way to actually be useful and with things that might actually win. And I think it's really exciting. Um, and the last thing I'll say is about, about how exciting it is, or just two quick things is one, is that this is clearly an anti-war movement. We don't know how long it will last, but it's clearly an anti-war movement. And I just want to say that if you've been part of the anti-war movement before, or maybe multiple anti-war movements, you know that when Democrats get elected, the anti-war movement goes to sleep. When Obama came into office, he kept drone bombing, he kept you know all the occupations, but the anti-war movement disappeared. This is the most significant anti-war movement under a sitting Democratic president since Johnson in the late 60s against Vietnam. It's huge. And we're not talking about U.S. soldiers abroad. We're talking about U.S. support for a foreign entanglement, which usually Americans are totally checked out of. The significance or the potential here is really, really huge. And I think also you see mass protests in, you know, influencing Congress people to come on board, their their um, their staffs to come on board. You see uh, more people, you know, political opinion turning and you just you get a sense with the intransigence that Biden still feels. You still get a sense of how large the task is ahead of us like how much we have to do in order to actually fundamentally change the relationship and the support for, um, from, the, from the US for Israel. Thanks, Jason. Um, Alex, I'm gonna to turn to you. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think Jason's right in that BDS w was a big role, but, and, and, but I also just wanna add that BDS, the BDS movement was, um, oh, has always been supercharged um, by uh, Israeli assaults on Gaza. Operation Castellet in 2009, uh, Operation uh, Protective Edge in 2014, um, awesome. both um, massive Israeli campaigns, and um, and 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 these were also campaigns that were that you know if you want if if you know these were in the, these were campaigns in the era of social media, and in the era of Al Jazeera English I should say, so people could really see what was going on on the ground minute by minute, and and, and it was so horrific these these civilians. Um, just the images of Palestinian civilians being massacred by Israeli warplanes, I think that really activated a lot of people. But of course, just as Jason sort of mentioned, activation and anger is not enough. And um, there there were, I just want to mention sort of two um, political forces that were integral to making Israel into a more contested issue. Um, one is um, um, Barack Obama's presidency. Um, so, um, uh, this was a moment in which Israel began to become a uh, a a more polarizing issue, and and we see that today where, where there's wide gaps in how Democratic voters and Republican voters view Israel. Now the roots of this um, I think are many, but one is that you had Obama um, uh, pursue his signal foreign policy achievement, which was the Iran nuclear deal. You also had an an an, an enormous 
angry reaction from both APAC and Netanyahu. Netanyahu, of course, the f- famously coming over to the United States in 2015 and giving a speech to Congress urging them to stop Obama uh, from sealing this deal with Iran. And um, uh, uh, you know, the I think there was a real um, uh, sort of uh, there was there was a, a sort of democratic voter revulsion at this blatant interference by Netanyahu uh, and collusion with the Republican Party. And then, you know, this was um, sort of uh, supercharged by the Trump-Netanyahu alliance. And as a result, you had more Democrats um, being like, wait, what is this relationship? What, 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 I hate Donald Trump, who is, who is, you know, uh, best friends with Netanyahu. Therefore, I don't like Netanyahu. And so that, I think, both of that era kind of really began to to see this. And, and I also want to uh, point to kind of the, a more grassroots explanation, which is like the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, in 2014, of course, we had the Ferguson uprising. And that was, um, there was a, a reinvigoration of this tradition of Black Palestinian solidarity. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, then that, the, you know, the, uh, there was all sorts of, you know, uh, Palestinian delegations to Ferguson, um, you know, black delegations like the Dream Defenders going to Palestine, learning from each other, um, and 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 and, try, and trying to draw these parallels um, between the Black American experience and Palestinian experience under Israeli occupation. And um, because of the legacy of the civil rights movement, um, you know, the and you know, uh, I think Black Democrats um, are and, and sort of Black movements in general are seen by. Um, a lot of democratic voters as sort of like the the sort of moral conscious of a liberal uh, 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 sort of a liberal liberal America, and so this racial solidarity um, I think really um, fueled um, discontent with with the U.S. Israel relationship. Now, the black politics in Washington are more, more complicated than just black Palestinian solidarity. I mean, the, the majority of black Democrats are 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 allies of APAC. And there's all sorts of historical reasons why that is, but but um, you do see um, this this wave of of Democrats that Hannah's organization is supporting, like Cory Bush, Summer Lee, um, uh, and, and other b- uh, progressive Black Democrats who are really um, uh, uh, sort of um, sort of bringing the Ferguson um, moment and that Palestine solidarity into the halls of Congress. And so Cory Bush herself, of course, being a Ferguson protester and now being a member of Congress. Um, and so you see all of these forces kind of coming together and joining and, and creating the moment that we are seeing today. Thanks, Alex. Um, and on that note, Hannah, I want to turn to you before we turn to audience questions um, and ask you, because of the work that Justice Democrats does, how do you think we can um, continue to challenge or like best challenge the, the really deep hold of of this lobby in Congress? Um, and in the White House, as, as we've seen in the last six weeks. What are the ways for us to continue challenging that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the number one thing which uh, Alex and Jason were both talking about is the constituent activism in these congressional districts right now. So, you know, initially when this war started, there were, I think, fewer than 10 people who called for a ceasefire in all of Congress. And people, you know, at first, I think everyone was like, is this how it's going to be? Is it just the squad coming out on this issue or are other people going to move in that direction? And today, you know, six weeks in, we've seen 40 members of Congress and members of the Senate call for a ceasefire. Um, obviously, Biden is not there yet, um, and there's a lot of work to do there. But this message has been so clearly led by Jewish and Palestinian-led organizations together in solidarity, along with allies, that we need to be calling our members and we need to be moving for ceasefire. And I think this is something that is very popular, um, as we talked about in the polling, and a lot of Democrats are aligned on. So with that, I think that there is also, you know, other elected officials are emboldened by those that moved first. you know, really proud to work with some of those candidates that Alex mentioned uh, when uh, Rashida Tlaib and Cory Bush uh, came out in a big way uh, for ceasefire. You know, those 
nine-ish people rallied around them. But once people saw that, A, even if they didn't necessarily speak up on ceasefire, um, they could be targets of, you know, APEC spending money in their districts because they didn't like the silence or not like a blanket support statement for Israel. I think people began to feel emboldened and there is safety in numbers and when elected officials take leadership, others follow. Three, I mean, I think it goes without saying, the numbers are shifting a lot on support for a ceasefire and also support for Israel and sympathy for Palestine broadly. We know that right now, um, I think Jawan said this number earlier, 70% of voters under the age of 35 disapprove of Biden's handling of a ceasefire. That poll came out last week, I believe. And, you know, Democrats are looking at each other and saying, hey, this could actually, you know, if Democrats have to go against Trump and Biden is going against Trump, they need the vote. They need young voters or else they're going to have a really rough election cycle in 2024. And so I think that that is, you know, presenting itself over and over in public polls and people are taking notice. And finally, to be honest, in my heart of hearts, I think that there are a lot of elected officials that have moral clarity on this issue. I think a lot of them have not yet spoken out. Um, You know, we've recently seen some of the first Jewish members of Congress to come out in support of a ceasefire, which is a really big move in this moment. And I feel that more people are going to follow and we're seeing this almost on a daily basis at this point. So, You know, not all Democrats want to align themselves with Biden's handling of this um, issue right now. And I think they're not looking to him as the example. And there will be continued breaks and hopefully more folks calling for ceasefire. Thank you, Hannah. Um, And thank you, Jason and Alex. We have a lot of questions coming in that I'm going to turn to in a minute. But first, building off of what Hannah was just saying, you know, the, the bill started with very few members of Congress on it, the ceasefire uh, resolution. Um, there are now over 40 members of Congress calling for a ceasefire. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the pressure that they felt um, from people all around the country. Um, and we need to keep applying that pressure because Israel is not slowing down. Israel is continuing to um, bomb Palestinians in Gaza relentlessly. Yesterday, another school was bombed um, and they're not stopping. And so I want us to all just take a moment. It'll take less than 30 seconds for you to email your congressperson. Um, We're going to drop a link in the chat and you can do it um, throughout the Q&A. Share it with three people you know um, who are not on this call tonight. Um, Just send them a text. Takes a few seconds to do it. And let's take action together and make sure that this isn't just like a political education event, but this is actually us taking all this information and turning it into action um, and putting pressure to to end the complicity of our government in in this genocide that is unfolding. So as you do that, I'm going to turn to questions. Um, I'm going to read the first question aloud and any one of our panelists feel free to take this up. Um, the question is, how does APAC spending compare to the spending of other PACs? And why hasn't APAC gotten involved in GOP primaries like it has in Democratic primaries? Who would like to take that first? Alex? I was I was going to say, Hannah, do you want to take that? I can also add in after you. Yeah, Alex, I feel like you have maybe more of the hard numbers that I do there than I do. Um, So what I can say is last cycle in total, I believe APAC spent around $25 million in either support or opposition independent expenditure efforts um, in congressional and I believe that also includes Senate races. Um, By comparison, I'm not sure exactly what J Street perhaps spent, but I believe it was it was definitely in the five million ballpark or lower. Justice Democrats spent 2.5 million approximately. So you know when you look at it's really hard to know exactly who is donating to APAC because as folks have said it's a very obscured process there are a lot of ways that money moves that the public can't necessarily see um we do know from public information that there are some mega mega billionaire donors uh that give to APAC 
And that is just, a, you know, that's not something that we have at Justice Democrats, I know for sure. Um, but these relationships have built, been built over the course of probably decades at this point. So they have that resource. Um, you know, other organizations just don't have that to rely to. You know, they might get contributions from some wealthier individuals, maybe other organizations who care about the same type of work, but just not to that scale. Um, yes, um, I mean, APAC, uh, APAC's PAC and its super PAC combined, they're two separate entities, but I'm, I'm, I think we, we should combine them um, because they're obviously operated by the same people. Um, spent far more than than any other um, PAC uh, in 2022, um, and in terms of J Street, I mean J Street spent, I think it was like nine million dollars um, in all of its races versus APAC's 25 to 30 million dollars. I mean it's just a massive, massive gap. Um, and um, in terms of the 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 other um, part of the question, which was you know why why is why is APAC not involved in Republican primaries? Well, I think the simple answer is basically that, you know, um, uh, there is no um, movement of, of Republican primary challengers who are voicing opinions uh, that the U.S. should um, change its relationship to Israel. Rather, the dissenting opinion from Republicans is that the U.S. should be doing more to support Israel, uh, if that's possible. Um, you know, Republicans are lockstep in support for Israel, for um you know, and, and really, they have endorsed a, an annexationist agenda, whereas most Democrats will say that they support um, a two-state solution where there's an independent Palestine and, and Israel as a way to resolve the conflict. Republicans, um, thanks to, you know, the sort of uh, political political forces in the Israeli right that they're aligned with and, and white Christian evangelical influence, um, believe that, it, that, that Israel should, should have permanent control of the West Bank um, and, 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 and and formally annex the West Bank um, while keeping Gaza, you know, I mean, pre-October 7th, I guess, I'm not really sure what their vision is right now, but but keeping Gaza, you know, sort of in, in the sort of open air um, prison camp situation that, 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 that they were in with, with Israel imposing a blockade. Um, that's, that's a Republican agenda. There's no meaningful dissent from that. And, and, you know, I mean, I think it aligns with a larger Republican agenda of authoritarianism, white nationalism. Um, and and th these are all values that they see reflected in Israel. And so APAC has no reason to get involved in Republican primaries when the GOP establishment and uh, not to mention their, the, the, the top presidential candidate, Donald Trump, is voicing um, just full on support for Israeli apartheid. No, no need to, to, to even come to any sort of resolution, um, including a two state solution that, that most Democrats say they support. Thanks, Alex. Um, thanks, Alex and Hannah. Um, for question two, I want to turn to Jason. Jason, can you talk a little bit about J Street and what their role is um, in all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, J Street's in a hard spot right now. Um, I mean, I don't feel bad for them, but they're in a hard spot. Um, J Street was formed as, as the liberal, you know, sort of softer version of, of APEC. APEC was, you know, increasingly viewed as this hardline thing. And J, J Street, I, I think people legitimately, I, mean, I don't know, I'm not a J Street historian, but J, but I think the people at J Street were probably genuinely motivated by the desire to like pursue a, um, a, a different foreign policy that was that was that that had room for criticism of Israel that was not just defended at, at all costs. But what you know what we've seen, I mean, it was it was it was pretty devastating. I mean, October seventh was devastating for lots and lots of reasons. But what was shocking was that since then there has been no daylight between J Street and between APEC. None. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, when you're as Alex you know, was talking about before, you can either be democratic or you can be Jewish. And I think if you don't call out that contradiction, you're going to find yourselves in really difficult spaces. Like right now, it's very difficult to to to, to navigate. I don't know what's going to happen with J Street. It'll be interesting to see what happens. What I think that largely depends on how what you know how big how long people's memory are of what happened here, how long that goes into the electoral cycle. The other thing, I mean, it seems to me. I mean, I I don't know if uh, you know Alex and Hannah know much more than me, but it seems to me that. The, it's been a long time that the, the APEC, the, let me say it this way, the ADL presents itself as a civil rights organization. So what it tries to do is it smug, pack, you know, smuggles in support for Israel as like a, a, like a liberal value, 
you know, we and and fear of Palestinians and, and Islamophobia is a liberal value, and it's obviously bullshit. But what I think has been happening with APEC, you know, young people are moving to the left, and so APEC is moving to the right just by virtue of, of, of that dynamic. And I think it's 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 our responsibility in the next you know election cycles and the you know next, the next couple of years to pin the right to the right to say exactly what what Alex was saying, like. Trump, the Trump administration, huge supporters of Israel. There's all kinds of people on the right that are huge supporters of Israel. If Israel was really the only democracy in the Middle East, they would probably support people who are more in favor of democracy and not in favor of less democracy, right? So I think, you know, it, I think it really matters how long we can sustain the sort of movement that's emerging now and how long we can sort of inject and how successfully we can inject that into a national conversation. Because I think that you know supporting Israel as a liberal value rests solely on on on, on ignorance, and I and I don't mean that as an insult to people. I mean like that the mainstream media is not covering what's going on, that people don't remember, they don't know, they don't have access to that information. So if that's the case, um, I think we're going to be in a fundamentally different world, which should be very exciting to see. And I I think J Street, you know, I I I, I mean I think a lot of them want to do the right thing. I'd be very interested to see what what they, what they wind up doing in the, in that world. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, and this is something that was raised, I believe, by Alex and maybe Jason and Hannah too, but it's a question about Christian Zionism. Um, so can you talk about the lobbying impact of Christian Zionism um, and what role it plays um, in influencing U.S. foreign policy on Israel? Anyone can jump in. I, I mean, I can, I can go first. I mean, principally, the, the impact is within the Republican Party. Um, you know, white Christian evangelicals are not um, a significant part of the Democratic Party base. I mean, you can find white Christian evangelicals that are Democrats, but 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 overwhelmingly, they are Republicans. Um, and um, you know, there's a there's a full on sort of par parallel grassroots um, lobbying grassroots lobbying and organizing infrastructure in Christian communities, in Christian evangelical communities. You know, the obviously, unlike in, you know, cities, um, uh, you know, churches um, are, remain incredibly sort of important in, in these um, more um, suburban and rural communities and, and Christian Zionism are key parts of that. And as a result, you have this sort of wide, a widespread grassroots sentiment within white Christian evangelical communities that translates into, um, you know, lobbying. I mean, lobbying on a basically an open door for, for Republican politicians that, that very much agree with them. Um, and, you know, they, they, they do many of the same things that, that APAC does, just not on a bipartisan basis, just a sort of a solely trying a hard right kind of Republican basis. They have a, a massive conference in Washington, D.C., where Republican politicians show up. They take Republican politicians to trips to Israel, including to Israeli um, settlements in the West Bank, which they view as sort of part of the, the biblical um, heartland of, of Israel. They fundraise. They, they go to the West Bank to volunteer. So, I mean, Christian Zionism is – um, a very important part, but it's really an important part for the Republican Party. It is not at all a significant influence um, within the Democratic Party um, because, um, you know, Christian Zionists vote for for the, for, for, for Republicans. Um, so, you know, um, APAC, I mean, APAC is actually also part of this. I mean, APAC has forged ties with Christian Zionists and Christian evangelicals. They welcome Christian evangelicals to their conference and they, you know, um, count Christian evangelicals as, as among their their grassroots supporters. Um, and so there is that um, as well. So so APAC, um, which which does have, have deep relations with Democrats as well, has Christian evangelicals, but the Christian evangelicals in the, within APAC are, are those who, who have relations with Republican politicians, not with uh, not with Democrats. Thanks, Alex. Um, Jason, Hannah, if you want to chime in on this. Uh, Hannah, Hannah, do you want? To? Okay, cool. Um, I mean, like, uh, I, don't, I don't. It was a week ago or whenever it was that, like, a couple thousand, uh, uh, you know, Zionists wound up in D.C. for a protest. They claimed was like two hundred ninety thousand or whatever it was. Um, and John Hagee was on stage, right? He was on stage. This is Israel protest. First of all, I mean, it's, you know, I think Israeli politicians have gotten very good at saying one thing in Hebrew and then saying another thing in English. The Hebrew thing is like the genocidal stuff and the English stuff is like, oh, we're going to, we're working for peace. 
But I don't think everybody at that rally had the same discipline. Like when they start chanting, no ceasefire, no ceasefire, no ceasefire. It's chilling. It's chilling. And there was a number of chilling things that, that Hagee's, you know, speaking from the front. This is a guy, you know, everything Alex says is right. This is this is a guy who said that, you know, Hitler was the God's way of sending the Israel uh, Jews to Israel or something like that. You know, he's like, you, you can't get much more anti-Semitic than this guy. And Chuck Schumer standing on stage. And I don't know the full lineup, but you have a bunch of people standing on stage with this guy saying, the you know, like, basically co-signing with what they're saying. I think it's in, you know, uh, I think it's an, it, there is a, there is, it's no doubt about the amount of money and and people that they bring to the other side. I think it's also an opportunity, like what I was saying about pinning the right to the right. We want to make sure that we understand, that people understand that Israel is a fundamentally right-wing project. And the more that we can do that, uh, I think the, the, the more marginal uh, we're going to be able to, to make uh, the Israel influence. Thanks, Jason. Um, Okay, another interesting question that's on this topic, and then I'm gonna sort of shift away a bit, but um, someone asked, why is there no counter lobby? Um, why is there not an anti-Zionist lobby that can exert influence? Um, and I think it's a it's a really interesting, interesting question. Um, curious what you all have to say. I guess I can start by saying just from an organizing large uh, dollar donor perspective that I don't know um, historically that there has been enough of an appetite uh, to fundraise and consistently sustain a lobbying vehicle like that. Um, it's really challenging to have to go against hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions, whatever the case may be. Um, on the PAC side, and having a lobbying operation is totally different, something I'm unfamiliar with, and I think the left historically has not done lobbying at such a scale. Um, it tends to be just uh, not something, not skills that most folks in the movement have uh, used before. I don't know, Jason or Alex, what do you think? Um... No, I mean, what you said in terms of money makes, I mean, that that's what I was going to say. I mean, I, I was going to say like, well, there is, <laughs> I mean, there is a counter lobby, right? I mean, there is like a, there is a, there is, as Sumaya had said over, over the past 10 years, you know, you have a JVP action, the the electoral organizing wing of Jewish Voice for Peace that started, um, I think just a couple of years ago, tw like two years ago, Jason could, could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you, you have, um, uh, other, uh, 501 C4s, you know, the sort of those who can focus more on, um, electioneering, um, there, 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 you know, if not now has, has that, the, you know, American Muslims for Palestine, um, has, has their own, you know, so there is a counter lobby, right? It's just, they don't have the money. I mean, you're talking you're talking $30 million, right? Like, I, I don't know what JVP's budget is. I, I don't know what If Not Now's budget is. It's not, it's not 30 million. The, the overall budget, right? Apex budget is probably even, even further, you know? Um, it's just, it's a money game. And, and, and of course, you know, if you don't have money, you, you want to organize people and that's what people are trying to do. But of course you also need to have money if you want to play that game in, in, in DC. And I think, right, that in addition to protests and, um, grassroots organizing and, you know, all, all sorts of things, you know, um, trying to establish a counter lobby is very important to shifting things. And, and there has been some success, right? Like, you know, 10 years ago, there was not, um, there would not be, you know, 20 to 30 members of Congress consistently speaking out on Israeli human rights abuses, right? But there are only 20 to 30. So you need more. To get more, you got to elect more people, etc. So there's all these factors that, that come to play. There is the beginnings of a counter lobby is just not yet, you know, able to, to go toe to toe with APAC. Yeah, um, just to throw, I mean, I think what, what Hannah and Alex said is totally right. I, I want to throw in a, a few extra things. Um, like what, Al, you know, I was, what, he, what he finished on, it made me think like the left has this 
I mean, the left has many crazy problems, but like they have a crazy problem of like forming camps at the moment. There's not a left that's having debates. There's left that form camps where I, if you agree with me, I'll talk to you. And if you agree with me, I'll talk to you. And we won't actually talk to people who disagree. So you have half the left telling people who are doing electoral work that are not interested in doing anything but electoral work that they shouldn't do electoral work. You have people who are doing electoral work telling people who are trying to do organizing from the ground up who are not going to do anything but they shouldn't do that, right? It's like, well, you know, what's Hannah saying before, these strategies are mutually reinforcing if we want. There's no way that the 10 sponsors, that then more and more and more people would be able to speak their conscience if they didn't actually feel some support from below. So one of those things is we just have to understand that there's like a dual strategy here of like getting people elected and a bit building from the, you know, the base. Um, the, the second thing I want to say is that, I mean, there's lots of, I mean, I guess there's lots of rich liberals for sure, you know, I mean, like whatever we hear, but like the people who are bankrolling the right are stupid rich. I mean, it's like we can't get our heads around the kind of money they have. They can drop money on failed experiment after failed experiment after failed experiment and just form a new organization or a new pack or this and that. And the <laughs> these are, you know, oil money or, or, or industry money, whatever it is, like it would be hard for us to compete just in terms of raw dollars. That this is why, like, it's helpful to, that we're, what we're saying is true, right? <laughs> that we can convince people that that what we're saying is right. Um, that all that money is there to wash and you know just create a cloud of bullshit that people can't see through. The the last thing I'd say is like I wonder what like because the U.S. I just want to think about. I want to come back to what I was saying at the beginning about like Israel's profitability for the United States because we hear about all these ungodly amounts of money that go to Israel for military aid. But where do we think that goes? Israel does not make its own weapons. I mean, for the most part, that goes back to U.S. corporations. So the U Biden signs a check that goes to Israel. They send it back to Boeing or Raytheon or whoever. So the people who are helping prop up the the the, the you know U.S. capital are intensely invested in this process. It's not even about geopolitical maneuvering. It's about like whoever wants to kill people, we're happy to have, support them because they're going to buy the our things that kill people. So I guess. You know, I, I appreciate the question enormously because I think it gives us a chance to open up a bunch of questions. But I think we ha it really for it, it begs for us to 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 assess our theory of change. Like, what do we think is going to change? We fundamentally think that if we shout loud enough, Joe Biden <laughs> is going to like is going to be like, all right, people really really want this. I'm going to do it. Right. I think it, like I think there's a question about you know when you think about the the Israel's utility to U.S. empire, when you think about Israel's utility to U.S. capital, what is it? That we what what kind of pact that we could we build that would offer them a compelling alternative, like a, like a, like a more more capital, more war. I mean that's I don't think that's the kind of left we want to we want to build, right? So I think we have to build pacts. We have to have a strategy that is both in you know in the halls of power and outside on the streets. But I think the ultimate strategy of of just putting our eggs in like a pack basket that will suddenly like be able to influence people out of support for Israel. I, I mean anything's possible. I I don't think that's I don't think it's likely. Thank you all for your, for your responses. Um, and actually on that note of like inside outside strategy, that's what makes us strongest. I think that's how we've been able to get the, uh, not just the resolution in Congress to get up to 40 supporting ceasefire, but also just like this massive wave of protest and support in the streets and all this polling that's showing that the majority of Americans support a ceasefire. That didn't happen overnight. That happened through people speaking out and organizing. Um, on the ground, grassroots, as well as in Congress. Um, in order to keep that up, before I go to the next question, I want to remind people again, email your Congress member. The links are in the chat. Take action. Send it to friends if you haven't yet. If you already did that, send it to another three. I feel like most of us have at least six friends. Um, and also find a protest near you. There are dozens and dozens of protests happening this week. And if you go to gazaspalestine.org, You'll be able to look up your city and see what protest is happening there. So also encourage you to do that. And the links are in the chat. So so go to the chat to find them. And then I want to move on to the next question. We will take a couple more and then and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, but the next question is an interesting one. Um, is it possible that after this war, Israel will not be the best ally for U.S. and for the U.S. in the Middle East? Um, and I think there's a couple ways of interpreting this question, but I'm going to offer my interpretation for you to answer. <laughs> um, and that is, we've seen this huge public shift in opinion in the U.S. Um, people are, it seems, people are no longer okay with this unconditional support that the U.S. is giving Israel. And I think that translates as well into the military funding that is going to Israel. Um, and also in the last 10 years, certainly the last five 
um, this unwavering support for Israel, there are cracks that have begun to show. And there are many reasons for those cracks that I won't get into, but would love for you all to. Um, what does this mean in terms of how the relationship will shift in the coming years? I know it's a big question, so feel free to take any part of it and, and run with that. I would just, uh, uh, sorry, I'll just start. Up. I would just say that I think when, it's, when you're talking about relationships that is important, there's an enormous amount of, there's an enormous amount of flexibility in the relationship. I mean, I think, you know, uh, again, Alex was talking about the, the, the relationship between democracy and uh, being an ethno state. And I think, you know, like what happened last November, I think the election was, is that like, you know, Israel came out and said, we want to go far on, far into the ethno. We want to go far into the Jewish supremacy. I think it's entirely possible that uh, something that emerges from this is that it's no longer feasible to say, you know, Jewish, to, to, to say Jewish supremacy things. They, they was open, you know, calls for this. And so I think it's entirely possible that, that, that there's a, you know, Netanyahu coalition loses. There is a reform slate that says we're going to put a kinder face you know, on this. I think there's any number of ways that, that, that this could play out. I also think that in, within the U.S. government, there's also I think there's debates about what's the best way to support Israel and what's the best way to package Israel. Um, I don't I don't see the support going away. I think Israel is going to be a good partner for it for a while, not because people think Israel is a nice person, but exactly the opposite. The reason that the United States first invested in Israel is because it could be a bulldog, is that it was in the region, it had weapons and was willing to use them. So I think that there's, I think there's still, a, a, until we can build a movement that can actually create real crisis for the U.S. state and continue to support Israel, I think it's, they're going to continue to try to find ways to creatively, uh, to creatively maintain that relationship. Um, just one thing I'll quickly add is, you know, um, for many years, the sort of conventional wisdom was that in order for Israel to be integrated into the wider Middle East, you, they had to um, come to a resolution with Palestinians. Um, uh, but um, the, the agreements known as the Abraham Accords forged by the Trump administration, uh, I think, um, uh, shattered that, that notion. Now, this is, I should emphasize that these were not deals because the grassroots of Bahrain and uh, uh, Morocco and Sudan and and um, um, uh, missing another big country, um, you know, wanted to forge peace with Israel it's because their authoritarian leaders wanted to, and they and they and they saw it as um, they they basically they they wanted to sort of um, uh, leave um, Palestinians out of it and and pursue their own authoritarian uh, and economic interests with Israel. So it's not as if Israel is the one um, sort of player in the Middle East that has this um, retrograde authoritarian bent. It's joined by an architecture um, that includes Bahrain and, and Sudan and Morocco and, and Saudi Arabia that have uh, that are sort of pursuing uh, in, 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 in alliance with the US um, sort of anti-Iran um, agenda. Um, and, and this war has put some strain on that. Um, you see Saudi Arabia, um, you know, pushing for, ce for, for ceasefire and, and, and the Saudis basically putting um, uh, normalization talks with Israel on, on ice, but no country um, in the Gulf that has uh, forged open relations with Israel. Um, sorry, it was the United Arab Emirates. I can't believe I forgot them. That had in addition to Bahrain and Sudan and Morocco, no country has broken off ties with with Israel, and and, and um, you know they have their own geopolitical interests to pursue. Um, so I just want to sort of kind of add in that geopolitical analysis to to kind of um, say not to discourage people, but to say that there is this authoritarian enemy that Palestinians and their supporters are facing, uh, and and um, you know that's that's important to reckon with. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's incredibly important and something that's being discussed more and more is that we can't treat Palestine as this island in the Middle East that, in fact, both historically and today, it's very much connected to everything that's happening in the region, um, just like Israel and, and the U.S. are. Um, Hannah, I want to turn to you and go back to APAC for a minute. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about how APAC has operated in the last cycle? I know there's like some some interesting fun facts about it. Yeah, so something for for everyone viewing this from home, um, something that APAC did not do pretty kind of notably is talk about Israel um, when they were attacking or supporting candidates. And I personally am very curious to see, you know, as the slew of campaign ads begin to hit the air next year, is APAC going to talk about Israel even when, you know, especially when they're playing in these democratic primaries, they know that they have lost the, and at this moment, like Democrats are breaking for a ceasefire, which is not what APAC is supporting. And I'm curious to see if, um, you know, they're going to take the tack that they did last cycle and just attack candidates um, on their characters and like make them out to be big and scary for whatever reason, or if they're actually going to talk about the issue that they are lobbying for. So just just the thought I've been having. Um, just curious what we'll see. Thanks, Hannah. Um... We're going to end with with a question that I think will be difficult to answer. And so a good question to end with. Um, someone asked, is there a solution for an end to the impunity of Israel? Uh, open question. I think another way of framing this question is what what will end this? What will end this um, settler colonial project, this ethnic cleansing of Palestine? Is it as simple as like if the US wasn't supporting Israel, Israel would not be able to continue with its project? Um, <laughs> I'll take a first crack. I, I don't really have a great answer to this, but um, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't want to, I don't really want to get to speculation. I don't know, like. Some people, someone, someone on Twitter asked, you know, if Israel had to choose between settlements and U.S. aid, what would they choose? I, um, in this current Israeli government, I think they would choose settlements. Um, but, um, you know, again, that's speculation. I think there's legitimate debate as to, you know, whether Israel would continue what they're doing without U.S. support. I mean, it's sort of, right now, it's like the U.S. and Israel are so joined to the hip that, that, that it's tough to envision. But what I will say is like. You know, there's a couple, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to happen to change. I mean, one, obviously the U.S. is central to this. U.S.'s role as um, the, the U.S. shields Israel from facing any accountability for its actions on the international stage. So when there's efforts at the United Nations um, to um, uh, center Israel for its settlement building in the West Bank, the U.S. vetoes it. Um, when the International Criminal Court uh, opens up an investigation into Israel, the U.S., um, tries to sanction the ICC as during the Trump era. Those sanctions have been lifted, but the U.S., of course, the political pressure that the U.S. Put, puts on international bodies that try to um, uh, sort of uh, give, sort of impose accountability on Israel is is immense. So um, that's why organizing in the United States, I'm, I'm not an organizer, I'm a journalist, but I do know that organizing and sort of changing, um, you know, uh, changing the members of Congress, ch changing who's in Congress, changing who's in the White House, um, all of those things are deeply important in order to enact the policy changes that are needed to break the U.S.-Israel alliance. Um, and of course, there needs to be massive changes in um, in Israel-Palestine. Um, even if the U.S. you know tomorrow decided to 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 withdraw support for Israeli apartheid, I don't think the Israeli Israeli apartheid would would suddenly crumble. It would certainly face a, a huge blow but it wouldn't suddenly crumble and um there needs there obviously there's you know uh resistance needs to come from within israel palestine there's a lot of obstacles to that um i mean in, in the west bank today you you see a lot of protests but you don't see an eruption of uh massive uh, popular protests throughout because of the role of the palestinian authority which you know we didn't couldn't really get into but um you know there's all sorts of obstacles to um, you know, uprisings against Israeli rule and, and of course, obstacles to like changing uh, U.S. support. So I think, you know, a combination of um, changes in U.S. support and, um, you know, changes on the ground are, are going to lead to the end of, of the situation. Obviously, that's a tall order. 
Thank you, Alex, for, for attempting to take this question on. Um, Jason, do you want to do you want to add anything? Uh, I mean, I, I think what Alex says is right. Um, I just want to point out, like, you know, make one small point that, like, I think there's a lot of, I, I think what ju what justice in Palestine means is is a complicated thing given what's happened over the last 75 years, and so I think that there's a number of different questions. So if uh, Israel should stop, you know, what, what, you know, a specific set of legislative, uh, you know, prohibitions, uh, you know, if Israel should should take the wall down. If Israel should let, you know, uh, the, the 40 to the 67 boundaries, like, you know, Palestinians actually live with one another. If Israel would, you know, if if they, if, if Palestinians are going to be able to, to have the right of return, which they should under international law and come back to their homes. I think there's any number of ways we can slice what justice means that um, that feels very far away, given what we've all laid out. But I think, it, you know, it can be it can be a really beautiful vision. I think that's I think that's what we should sort of make our North Star to, to try to get to. Thanks, Jason. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for attempting to answer that question. I mean, the one thing I'll just briefly add is that a very direct step in the direction of um, ending Israel's occupation um, over Palestine, its blockade of Gaza uh, settlement project is ending US funding for Israel. That is a big step that will take us in the right direction. Um, and of course, there's like all sorts of intricacies and things that need to be figured out. Um, but ending U.S. military funding is a big one, and it's something that Israel relies on for propping up its its um, settler colonial project and gaining the influence and sorry, not the influence, the support of powers in the region across the Middle East and also globally um, because of the the role and the control of, of U.S. empire. And so I think that's like a very direct target for. for all of us here in the U.S. is ending that military funding. Um, and obviously the calls for a ceasefire right now are part of that. So with that, um, thank you so much, Hannah, Alex, and Jason for being here tonight. Um, this was a really brilliant panel. Um, I think I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone watching at home learned a lot. Um, and this will be available on YouTube after the event so people can return to it, um, share it with others, um, and use it in, in fruitful ways. And thank you to Haymarket for hosting this, um, as well as uh, Democratic Socialists of America, Hadada Justice Project, Jewish Currents, Jewish Voice for Peace, and Justice Democrats. A lot of J. Wow, <laughs> I just realized that. Um, and just a reminder again to use the action tools to email your member of Congress, to call your member of Congress and leave a voice note, to share that with friends. There's a great phone bank happening um, tomorrow with Adala Justice Project and DSA New York City. Um, you can join that. The, the link is in the chat. You can sign up and join several hundred other people as we phone bank together and try to pressure Congress for a ceasefire. And we're going to have another event just like this one, um, but focusing on the history of Gaza, how it came to be in the situation it's in right now, um, the various Israeli policies that led to the blockade, um, and all the questions that I think are floating around in people's minds that perhaps they're afraid or timid to ask, we're going to answer them. Um, it will happen in two weeks, the week of December 4th. Um, if you sign up on DSA's mailing list um, or Adada Justice Project's mailing list, you will get a notification about this event. Um, so you can RSVP. So make sure to sign up on the mailing list. They're both in the chat. And um, just remember to continue pressuring your member of Congress, keep going out in the streets. There are dozens of protests. Go to gazaspalestine.org to find one near you or to um, add one to the list of protests on there. And um, encourage friends, family, colleagues, um, folks in your union, in your school, on your campus to also get involved. Um, we know that it's been six weeks and the bombings, are, the bombs are continuing to fall. Um, and as many of us head home this week to be with family, Palestinians in Gaza are without homes and many without families. Um, and our government is complicit in this. And that's why we're here today, tonight. And that's why we'll continue to go out in the streets every day until we get that ceasefire. With that, um, I will say good night. Thank you again to our panelists and thank you all for watching. Thanks.